President Muhammad Buhari on Tuesday signed into law the 21.83 trillion 2022 appropriation bill passed by the National Assembly last week. The president, while signing the 2023 Appropriation Act at the Council Chambers of the State House, directed the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed to work with the federal lawmakers with a view to revisiting some of the changes effected on the executive budget proposals by the National Assembly. Speaking at the event, the president said his regime will speed up critical infrastructure projects nationwide as it races towards the finishing line on May 29, 2023. President Buhari said the aggregate expenditures of 21.83 trillion is an increase of 1.32 trillion over the initial executive proposal for a total expenditure of 20.51 trillion. Joining us on this show this morning to discuss the signing of the 2023 budget is John Sinchuku, Chief Executive Officer of Kauri Asset Management. Hi, Chief. John Sinchuku, Happy New Year. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us on the morning show. Uh, and Happy New Year to you indeed. Quickly, this is a deficit budget. Looking at the benchmarks, how realistic is this budget? Good morning, uh, Dr. Ruben Abati and uh, Oseni and everyone there. Uh, Happy New Year as well. Um, if you look at the benchmark, um, one of the things you look at, you look at the benchmark of your crude oil production of about 1.6, and then you look at the exchange rate of seven, uh, the um, crude oil benchmark price of about seven five dollars per barrel. I think if you start from the uh, crude uh, assumptions, oil assumptions, a crude benchmark of seven five dollars per barrel is feasible, uh, given the current ma global macroeconomic environment, given the fact that um, China is reopening its. Uh, uh, lockdown as a result of COVID, and therefore it's expected that demand for energy will increase further. Of course, we still are dealing with uh, the issue, the, uh, the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine, and the decision of the Western countries to put a price cap on Russian uh, uh, seaborne crude. So um, these factors will ensure that crude oil price remains elevated uh, in the new in the current year. But the problem will be the crude uh, volume. I, the best we've seen is that the uh, NNPC uh, and um, uh, other agencies of government announced that the, the crude production has gone back to about 1.1, 1.2 million barrels a day. Uh, but that, for you to be talking about 1.6 million barrels a day, average, for me, is very optimistic. I, I don't see uh, how the measure taken by the government will lead to an increase of more than 60% in crude production over the entire year. Because when you talk of a crude benchmark, uh, volume, you are talking of daily. Uh, what that means is that even if you have uh, a short shorting, uh, that subsequent productions will compensate for that shorting. And I don't think see that are feasible. So what we may end up is that we may have um, a budget expectation that uh, we will meet the budget uh, budgeted crude price, but in terms of volume, we're going to have a negative volume variance. That's uh, on, as it relates to um, the uh, crude price. Then the other um, elements of government revenue, uh, independent sources, uh, taxes, and other revenues. I also think maybe optimistic. Um, granted that with tax revenues have remained strong in the past couple of uh, uh, years, in the past two years, but even uh, at that, uh, a further increment in that uh, may not be feasible because beyond the financial services sector that has shown good performance in the third quarter of this year, uh, last year, uh, other sectors may struggle. The manufacturing sector, if you look at the GDP uh, report, you realize that the third quarter GDP, the manufacturing sector is beginning to struggle uh, because of increase in cost of doing business, increase in energy cost, increase in cost of funding. So in terms of tax revenue, government may be um, over budgeting when we expect that we're going to achieve this current uh, projected tax revenue. But all in all, the government has never achieved its projected revenue budget in the past four or five years. And we continue to increase that, irrespective of the fact that increasing it only gives us an incentive to increase the expenditure, which will have increased to about 21.8 trillion naira. And we end up with increasing budget deficit, which is putting a lot of pressure on our debt service because we are abandoning our debt, our, our debt, national debt. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you ended on the, um, um, the budget deficit and the implications of local and international debt. I'd like you to speak more a bit on this. Over 12, uh, uh, 12 
let me get the exact figure now. In terms of the deficit amount, 12.1 trillion naira uh, budget deficit. And the president has said that, and the Minister of Finance has said that this will be financed by a number of things, including more borrowings. What's your take on this? You know, um, the issue of uh, budget deficit has actually become a major problem for the country. And uh, um, the government seemed to not recognize that. Uh, and that's why they have got not to approach the physical planning and physical framework of the country the way they have adopted over the years. Um, if you talk of a budget deficit of 12 trillion naira, today uh, we are talking of uh, a budget deficit, I mean, a national uh, debt of more than 100 um, trillion, um, 22 trillion. So if you continue to balloon uh, creating additional bullying from the, by the federal government, what you end up doing is that you are going to crowd two things. You crowd out the private sector from borrowing, but most importantly, you impose a debt service obligation that will be difficult to meet in future. Today, Ghana, our next neighbor is going through some uh, difficulties. It's exactly what happened to them. When uh, they continued to in balloon uh, their borrowing, uh, hoping that uh, the revenue from those uh, infrastructure they were building will co compensate for the increased debt obligation, debt service obligation, it didn't happen. Today, the, Ghana had defaulted on local debt. Ghana is also defaulting on national, on uh, on international debt. We are pushing this country to that same situation because, as it stands today, our debt service to revenue, uh, if you, even if you use the budget figures, it I mean, government budget about more than six trillion in debt service. Total revenue is less than ten trillion. So our debt service to revenue um, is already in the region of 70 80 percent based on budget but in terms of reality the actual figures debt service to revenue is approaching 100 percent so if you have to use 100 percent of your total revenue to service debt then you're already in a debt trap because you don't have the the, the cash flow to even pay back the debt that mature and then you have to continue to borrow to implement every other thing. If the government has actually realized some of some of them have cried ourselves uh, uh, dry, and we have said this, some of the expenses of the government are non discretion are, are discretionary. Let's do away with those discretionary expenses. The issue of uh, uh, um, subsidy payment. If you look at if the, if you implement a subsidy payment for the first half of the year, we're going to spend about 3.3 trillion on 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 that uh, expenditure alone. That does not add any value, any economic value to the country. Then you look at capital expenditure. The government originally budgeted about 5.35 trillion naira for capital expenditure. And my position is that if you are going to bully every cobo that you spend on capital expenditure. Why don't you assource it to the private sector? If you actually have a proper framework, legal and commercial framework, you will attract private sector investment in some of these commercially viable infrastructure that we don't have to burden the government with the debt of that, uh, funding that infrastructure as well as the debt service. The reasons, critical reason for this is this. The government is not a very efficient user of economic resources. Private sector is known to achieve more value for money when it comes to investment. Government in government investment, there's a lot of there are a lot of leakages, and we're going to eliminate that. Private sector will build this infrastructure at the cheaper cost and at the more efficient uh, rate. I mean, they, they will achieve a completion time faster than the government will do, and that will save the government about under five point uh, five point three five trillion naira. And government will focus on critical social infrastructure, education, healthcare, uh, uh, security. That way, we're not going to borrow about eleven trillion naira. And if we continue this way, we are certainly going to go into a debt situation where we will not be able to service our debt. All right. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, you good to see you again. Are we not there already? Are we not there already? Because look at what the president said. And a lot of people have been missing what the president said. I'll repeat it. He said yesterday that, please, National Assembly, help us break the CBN Act, Section 38, that says, hey, you cannot pay ways and means by securitization. You have to pay with the preceding revenue. He now went further to say that if the National Assembly does not accede to that, there's already an interest of $1.8 trillion that will pay already by not securitizing the loans of the $22 trillion. We don't know what was done with the money for. What is going on there? I think a lot of people are not beaming the searchlight on what he really said there. Why is this 1.8 trillion interest coming from again? Was it part of the money declared? 
And is this part of the scheme to be able to get more four trillion from the ways and means? Okay, so hey, just to shock, to, to shock you, um, in the in Agon year, as at October, the government had borrowed by ways and means about six trillion naira from the cent central uh, central bank. Um, uh, those things are what summed up about the twenty-two uh, trillion that the government has borrowed from the central bank in the past couple of years. And uh, the president said that the cost of servicing that, the interest they have to pay the uh, central bank is about, would be about 1.8 trillion. Of course, you know the government uh, is trying to securitize that uh, ways and means by offering a 40-year debt instrument at 9%. And that is materially sub uh, market rate. Of course, what they're basically doing is, uh, let me beat out the paper, because if you offer that instrument at 9%, nobody will buy it. You're eventually going to sell it at a discount. Um, uh, and when you say that the discount, it simply means that central bank that is offering that instrument will take the lap. They will take the wrap of that discount. Uh, currently, a federal government debt instrument, 30-day year bond is trading about 14, 15%. So if you come to the market and issue a 40-year bond at 9%, what you are basically saying to those of us who understand how the economics work is that the person who issued that bond, who is holding that bond, will sell it at the discount if they have to exit that bond. And that simply means that bond would go for a rate of about 18% for anybody to buy it. So the central bank, would, instead of getting back about 22 trillion, they will get back maybe about 18 trillion maybe about 16 trillion. But that's not what we're discussing today. The issue is that we have already seen uh, some of the instant laws that put checks and balances in government uh, borrowing uh, or observed in, in breach. Of course, we know that the CBA Act says that before you can lend further to the federal government, you cannot lend more than 50 percent of the previous year's revenue uh, to the federal government, and that before you lend further, they must pay back the previous outstanding. That has not been observed. That's why we are talking of 22 trillion in ways and means funding, because if we had observed it, they would have paid previous years. Uh, and then we also have the Fiscal uh, Responsibility Act that stipulated that you cannot, the budget deficit will not be more than 3% of, uh, of our national uh, GDP. That has also been uh, observed in, 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 in breach. Of course, the current budget is about 4.3% uh, deficit of the uh, GDP. So the questions are, where is the National Assembly when the laws are being breached and they are still passing laws that currently breach existing laws? So the, the issue is that we're already in that situation. And unfortunately, um, the three arms of government that are supposed to act as checks and balance against each other, it seems not to be functioning in the current government. Well, Chief, let's talk about the finance bill. The president uh, refused to give his assent to the finance bill and he says, Members of the National Assembly should liaise with the Minister of Finance, Budget Planning, and other agencies to take a second look at uh, that uh, finance bill as proposed. Now, that finance bill, as it is, is imposing a tax burden on Nigerians, corporate tax from 30% to 35%. That petroleum uh, profit tax, everything, customs and excise, increase. But the president is saying they should go and take a look at it. Shouldn't they just go back to the assembly? Because, you recall, Nigerians were not given the opportunity to make an in in input into, that, uh, into the consideration of that bill. The House of Reps gave a three weeks public hearing notice. But before the public hearing took place, they passed it. The Senate gave 24-hour notice on the 21st, 22nd. Immediately, they, they, they passed the, uh, uh, the, the bill. Don't you think they should take that bill back to the uh, drawing board? Because, you know, imposing a tax burden on Nigerians may not uh, be the best way to go. I don't know what you think. Yeah, um, Dr. But you know, when I spoke earlier, I said that some of the, 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 the arm of the government that should have acted as a check for the executive seem to uh, not to, abdicate, to have abdicated their responsibilities. Uh, let me remind you in the first place, the Finance Act must be signed into law before the budget is considered and approved by the National Assembly. That's what the, uh, uh, the law says. I mean, the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act says that you have to, because the Finance Act is the basis on which the assumptions of the budget are underpinned. So if you have not passed, the, if the president refused to sign the Finance Act, on what basis are you passing the, uh, the, the fiscal uh, bill and then getting the president to sign it. So, because look at it, 
the basic assumptions that are embedded in the budget are taken from the Finance Act. The government projecting revenue. So if you are projecting a revenue of X and the Finance Act has not been signed on which basis the revenue should have been derived, why are you going to achieve the revenue? So what we are doing uh, today is that um, we are just living by the day, hoping that uh, some miracles will happen and the economy will bounce back. Uh, if we don't do the right things, uh, no miracle will happen. Economies are not managed by miracles. The basic thing we are looking at today is that if you look at the Finance Act, like you pointed out, which uh, the president has not signed, you are talking of an increase in corporate tax uh, uh, rate. I had mentioned earlier that the manufacturing sector is going to go uh, through some difficulties this year. One of the factors that prepared the manufacturing sector last year and the preceding year was because of low uh, cost of funds. Today, if you go to borrow from the banks, some banks have their, uh, their base rate, their prime lending rate at above 20%. So how can the manufacturing sector that has a longer asset conversion cycle thrive? It seems today that the sector that is actually enjoying most, it seems to be the, only finance, uh, the financial services sector, particularly the banking sector. So if that be the case, where are you going to derive all your uh, taxes from the banking industry? The oil sector had, uh, the oil and gas sector had uh, a, 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 a decline in the last quarter of this year, about 11%. So where would the income from the oil sector is going to difficult, the manufacturing sector is going to difficulties, even the telecommunications sector, apart from the boom in data services, would have also been in some difficulties. If you look at the key sector that drive the economy, you have the largest sector, which is the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector is not, it's not formalized, so they don't hardly pay taxes. There are just about two or two or two companies in the agriculture that are quoted. The rest are informal, so you don't derive so much tax from a sector that, comes, that contributes about 23% of the GDP. The second sectors are the ICT sector and the trade sector. The trade sector is also highly not formalized. They both two sectors account for about 15.3% of the GDP each. The trade sector is also highly not formalized. You want to increase tax, it's not going to affect most of them because many of them are not formalized and they don't pay appropriate corporate tax. So you are going to impose that tax on the telecommunication sector. Then the other sector is the manufacturing sector. And then you have the oil and gas sector. These six sectors account for more than 65 percent of the GDP or 70 percent of the GDP. Of the, these three sectors, only the uh, finance sector, which accounts about 4 percent of the GDP, is thriving. I've not even mentioned it among the five major sectors. So where are you going to derive this tax? What you end up doing is that you're going to overburden the few institutions that are viable, and you're going to depress them further. And today, we are seeing a decline in GDP growth rate. GDP growth rate declined from 3.5 percent to 2.25 percent. If you continue with this trajectory, you're going to see a further decline in GDP growth rate and at a co an economy that is still a very fragile in terms of recovery. All right, so economists have said that, uh, as, and you, as you have t talked about, that we are spending more money on debt repayment um, in, as opposed to other critical sectors. We have education, health, you know, um, security and the likes. However, the, the president has said it is a necessary evil. He's had to borrow more to take us out of two recessions in seven years. I'd like you to respond to this statement. And second of all, the IMF's recommendation that the Central Bank of Nigeria should phase out, or the government should phase out the CBN's financing of, 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 government, of government. What's your take on this? Okay, let's start from the uh, aspect you just mentioned, the, the issue of phasing out CBN uh, funding or financing of government. I did mention earlier that in the last year, about as of October, the government had, the federal government had borrowed more than six trillion from the central bank, uh, principally because of the structure our, of our physical uh, uh, framework. And we need to go to the root of the problem. When the government said they need to continue to borrow to be able to pull the country out of recession, the two recessions we've entered into. I had given an example of Ghana. Ghana's case is even that they borrowed to build infrastructure. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, I mentioned that the private sector is more efficient in terms of infrastructure uh, execution, in terms of cost, value for money, and time of completion. Uh, but government seem not to be considering that. Uh, as we continue to borrow and pile up debt, um, we are already at the point where debt service consumes the entire uh, government budget uh, revenue. Let's uh, play uh, uh, with some figures. In the current year, the government will spend about 6.6 .6 trillion naira on subsidy on petrol if we don't take out the subsidy by the end of June. 
If we take an assumption, we spend about 3.3 trillion. I expect that will even increase, uh, given the further depletion of the local currency. But let's assume we just add 6.6 .6 trillion naira to uh, capital expenditure of about 5.3, 5.8 trillion naira. You end up with more than 11 trillion naira. That's a budget deficit. So in effect, we could have eliminated the budget deficit by just addressing two items. If you are talking about over 6.6 uh, 6 trillion naira at debt service this year, by the time you bring in another 11 trillion naira deficit, you will increase uh, the, the federal government debt from about 42 trillion to about 50, uh, 54 trillion. So if you increase that, your entire debt service will increase beyond the 6 trillion. And that simply means you'll be approaching maybe 9 trillion, which will completely, even with your budgeted figures, will wipe out whatever you have budgeted. And the approach is that we cannot continue in the same route uh, and expect a different outcome. The concept of borrowing to finance uh, capital expenditure in a country that has minimal revenue capacity should be reconsidered. There are other ways we can do that. If we bring private sector to build infrastructure, that will catalyze higher level of productivity, higher level of economic activities without a burden on the federal government. And that high level of uh, economic activity will eventually lead to a growth in the, an increase in GDP and the government will have the way without to generate more tax revenue. But what we're doing today, because when we say we are borrowing to fund infrastructure, what if you borrow 11 trillion and you spend uh, 5.8 trillion on infrastructure, can you genuinely and honestly say you borrowed to fund infrastructure? When you, you spend less than 50 billion we're borrowing to fund infrastructure, can you reasonably say that? And I think the answer is simple no. So the government, my approach to you is that we need to one, eliminate expenditure that are discretionary and avoidable, that are not critical to the well being of the economy and the citizens. And two, and one of, one of which is the issue of subsidy, uh, the way we're presenting subsidy. The second thing is that we need to reappraise our approach to funding of infrastructure, capital uh, budgets. We need to identify those that are commercially viable and concession in the private sector investors to fund, while the government will focus on critical sectors like you mentioned, education is very key, healthcare is very key, security is very key. If the government spends all their money to address, improve the quality of education, improve the available access to education, and then improve security in the country and improve healthcare, they would have done the critical things, okay. the heavy lifting we need to push the economy. Okay. Okay, real quickly, real, real quickly as we start to, you know, wind things down, I want to talk about the fact that we are overburdening the manufacturing sector. The food and beverage sector has 22%, you know, of the, uh, of the manufacturing sector. And this sugar tax that is about to overburden them, what do you say about this new sugar tax that is overburdening the manufacturing sector, the food and beverage sector? You know, what I would say is that the government has been uh, flapping its hand like a drowning uh, person trying to get revenue from wherever it can. Uh, the issue of um, um, tax on uh, um, sweetened uh, uh, drinks has some social values, but the way the government has approached it is basically driven by revenue uh, objective, uh, which when you want to impose taxes on any sector of the economy, you have to weigh all the implications. Uh, today, many of those uh, operators are producing uh, drinks that are not very uh, um, very sugary, that are, you have zero uh, drinks, zero uh, sugar drinks, but taxes will be imposed on those things. So government should consider the benefit of extracting more tax and imposing more tax burden on this sector as against uh, the revenue to generate from that, uh, sec uh, that tax. And as it stands today, uh, the emphasis on just let's just tax them, let's just get as much tax as we can. You want to impose tax on telecommunication uh, consumption, you're imposing tax on uh, drinks, uh, um, uh, carbonated drinks, you're imposing tax on increasing the uh, corporate tax, you, are, you have increased recently the value added tax by 50%. All these are burdening consumers whose uh, purchasing power has been eroded by inflation and devaluation of the exchange rate. At the end of the day, we, we keep saying that Nigerians are getting poorer because part of it is imposed by government withdrawing the income that they should have had. One, we have worsened their, consumption, uh, their income by, uh, due to inflation. I mean, disposable income due to inflation, exchange rate deflation, and now you're imposing additional taxes on them in, their, in terms of consumption tax and even uh, personal income tax.
Well, on that note, uh, Chief uh, Johnson Chuku would like to thank you very much for joining us on The Morning Show.